Okay, so benign lipomatous tumors. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of these, not all of these. That would be incredibly boring. But the fact of the matter is, most of the time when you see a fatty tumor, it's a lipoma and you don't really give it much thought. And so if you find yourself blowing over most of these cases, that's probably okay because most of them are just run-of-the-mill lipomas. But you can see there are some uh, variants of benign lipomatous tumors that you don't see that often. For example, um, this is a good one. Chondroid lipoma, um, you may never see one of these. They're actually ridiculously rare. The ones that you will see the most uh, and cause the biggest problems are spindle cell and uh, pleomorphic lipomatous tumors. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that because that's a really common consult that we get. Okay, and lipomatous tumors of intermediate malignancy. What does that mean? Um, soft tissue tumors like, like GYN tumors, we have a lot of tumors of intermediate malignancy. And in general, that refers to tumors that frequently recur, but rarely, if ever, metastasize. There's only one in this category. It goes by two names, atypical lipomatous tumor or well-differentiated liposarcoma. You can use either of those terms. Nobody cares. As long as the person reading your report knows what you're talking about, right? I actually use both terms. I put, I, I usually call them atypical lipomatous tumor, parenthesis, well-differentiated liposarcoma. Just so anybody reading my report is not confused, hopefully. We'll talk about this a lot. Okay, malignant lipomatous tumors, liposarcomas. This is WHO classification of liposarcoma. Not particularly helpful. There's some terms here that I've never used, like liposarcoma NOS, a mixed type liposarcoma virtually never occurs. So this is the way I think of liposarcomas, and this is the way I would urge you to think of them. There's three families of liposarcoma. The one at the top is the one I'm going to talk about this morning. The other ones I'm going to talk about probably variably throughout my other lectures. Okay, the one I'm going to talk about today are the atypical lipomatous tumors. And we've got the most common ones are the, the ones that actually look like lipomas, so we'll call them lipoma-like. This is the most common one that all of you have seen, the sclerosing lipo, well diff liposarcomas with those fibrous bands, and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly. Inflammatory liposarcoma happens. It's pretty rare. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it. I'm definitely going to spend some time talking about D-diff liposarcoma. It's a pretty common tumor, relatively speaking. I put spindle cell liposarcoma in quotes and in a different color because for a while it was categorized as a variant of well diff liposarcoma. It's not. And I'm going to talk about this at the end. It's a, it's a controversial, it's an, it's an evolving topic, but I think it's worth discussing because you're going to see those tumors too. Okay. The next family is the myxoid and round cell liposarcoma family. Those are the same tumors. They're not separate tumors. It's one family of tumor. Myxoid liposarcoma is low grade. Round cell liposarcoma is high grade. And uh, I, I will eventually talk about those as well. And then pleomorphic liposarcoma is its own category. Um, it's basically a high-grade sarcoma with pleomorphic lipoblasts. And that's all you need to make that diagnosis. So any questions about this? Because I think this is it's an important um, jump off point. Okay. I always share this slide because it reminds me to talk about this. So this is, this was a consult that we got. You can't tell probably, but there's three trays of fat here. Okay. Which is a great deal of fun. And you can see that, uh, and I swear I didn't put these dots here, but the person who sent the case put the dots there. What do you think they're dotting? Yeah, exactly. You've heard this before, or you can guess. They sent this to us saying, we think it's a liposarcoma because we think that, for example, between the dots, there are lipoblasts. And so, and this is not facetious at all. The one thing you do not want to do in looking at this case is look between those dots or look for lipoblasts at all. I never look for them in this setting. And I, I'll clarify that in a second. But for a well-differentiated fatty tumor, just don't look for lipoblasts. Why, don't, why do I say that? Well, A, you can see lipoblasts in benign fatty tumors, believe it or not. B, you don't have to see lipoblasts in a malignant fatty tumor. And C, probably which is most important, is lipoblasts are in the eye of the beholder. What I'd like to do in the next uh, 50 minutes or so is talk about lobular carcinoma in situ and problematic uh, in situ breast lesions, and I have no relevant disclosures. So let's talk about breast carcinomas in situ, DCIS and LCIS. 
you need to remember that these are defined by their combination of cytologic and architectural features. They are not defined by their microanatomic location in the ductal lobular system. So even though we call them ductal and lobular, that is not necessarily where they are in the uh, terminal ductal lobular unit and uh, ductal system. In fact, almost all examples of DCIS and LCIS arise in the terminal duct lobular unit. It's very unusual for these things to arise in the large ducts. And you need to remember also that many structures that look to us like ducts in the breast are actually unfolded lobules. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, this concept of unfolding of lobules was proposed by John as a party um, in his seminal book that was published in 1979. How many of you are aware of this textbook? Yeah, so when I was a resident, which started in 1979, this was the only English language textbook of breast pathology. Now there are about a thousand breast pathology textbooks, but this was the only one that existed then. And it is a fantastic book. And if you are interested in breast and ever have a chance to get it, I suggest you do. But basically what he said was that when Various uh, pathologic abnormalities, including cysts and proliferative lesions, involve lobules. They uh, unfold, and it's basically like taking a glove and blowing into it, and the fingers sort of expand and merge into each other. So what starts out as a lobule with pathologic alterations and unfolding of lobules may wind up looking like a few single large spaces, uh, which look like ducts. So everything that looks like a duct in a breast is not a duct. It may be an unfolded lobule. So back to DCIS and LCIS, I think in most cases, the distinction between DCIS and LCIS is straightforward on H&E stain sections. And I don't think there's a person in this room that would mistake the upper picture for LCIS and the lower picture for DCIS. These are classic DCIS and LCIS. However, we have to acknowledge that some cases are diagnostically problematic. And there are several reasons for this. One is that the terms DCIS and LCIS each encompass a heterogeneous group of lesions, and they can have overlapping histologic features. Furthermore, until fairly recently, the heterogeneity of LCIS has not been well recognized, and anything that kind of deviated from classic type LCIS was likely lumped in with DCIS. So I'm going to spend the rest of this talk talking mainly about LCIS and its variants. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I want to go over kind of the textbook view of classic LCIS to make sure we're all starting at the same point. So this is a relatively uncommon lesion. It's detected in less than 5% of breast biopsies, almost always as an incidental finding in breast tissue removed for another abnormality. It's more common in premenopausal than in postmenopausal women. It's multicentric in the ipsilateral breast in about 50% of the cases and bilateral in about a third. It does not have any distinctive mammographic features, although some of these are detected because of microcalcifications on a mammogram, although the microcalcifications are not specific for this entity. For many, many years, it had been considered only to be a marker of increased breast cancer risk, and that is a generalized increase in breast cancer risk, pretty much equally divided in both breasts with a relative risk of about tenfold and an absolute risk of about 1% per year. But in the last 10 to 20 years or so, we've come to realize that not only is it a marker lesion, but it is also now recognized as a direct precursor to invasive lobular carcinoma. So I have uh, no disclosures. I wish I did, but anyway, objectives. We're going to learn about recent changes, modification on prostate cancer grading, how to accurately grade and stage prostatic adenocarcinoma, and also how to recognize unfavorable pathologic features of prostate cancer that may impact actually on reporting and also impact on how the patient will be treated. So very practical. So what is our role as pathologists when we look at prostate biopsy? Well, first of all, of course, we want to make a diagnosis, either of cancer or of no cancer. Then as may have an impact on initial therapy. We also assess prognosis by reporting parameters that are useful to the clinician. 
we estimate the likely benefit of adjuvant therapy, particularly if those unfavorable features are identified. And also, in cases where there's been treatment, we can determine recurrent disease after treatment. We're not going to focus on this today. And also we need to, as pathology, we help understanding the history of the disease and uh, in recent years also the integration of precision medicine with the different tests that can be done. So typically what happens, and you well know of course, the patient may present with an increased PSA or an abnormal DRE, prostate biopsy gets done, and there's two categories, either the biopsy is negative or the biopsy is positive and you detect prostate cancer. If you do so as pathologists, what we're trying to assess is, is this cancer going to be an indolent type of cancer so that the patient can undergo active surveillance or as aggressive features where the patient will not be considered for active surveillance, but will be uh, actually treated with definitive treatment, either, you know, radical prostatectomy or radiation. So this is an example of a needle core biopsy where there is an area of crowded glands. They, they look a little bit cystically dilated, but you can see that if you have higher power magnification, they're not atrophic actually. So these glands are actually abnormal. And then in a case, a similar case where you have a small focus of uh, uh, atypical glands, of course, you want to support uh, your diagnosis with the use of immunostains. This is a, a P63 stains that shows that those glands are all negative for basal cell marker. So this is an example of Gleason score 3 plus 3 equals 6, grade group 1, involving 5% of one of one core and measuring less than 1 millimeter. So what are the essential elements that we want to report on a needle biopsy for the prostate? So first of all, the histologic type. Most of the cases that we're dealing with are acinar adenocarcinoma of the prostate, but you need to be aware there are other entities that you need to recognize such as ductal adenocarcinoma of the prostate, different implication clinically, small cell carcinoma, of course, that is similar to small cell carcinoma or neuroendocrine high grade carcinoma in other organs, sarcomatoid carcinoma, and intraductal carcinoma that we will discuss later on. Then we report in the Gleason score and the grade groups. Now both those needs to be reported. We also report the percentage of pattern four, and we'll discuss this in more details, particularly for cases where the overall Gleason is three plus four or four plus three, so that category of Gleason score seven, and the presence or absence of cribriform pattern four. The location of positive cores, most of the time now they are labeled with a specific location, so there's nothing more that you need to do, just report it. We quantitate the amount of tumor in the core, either in terms of percentage of length or millimeters or both. And then, of course, if they're present, we want to report the presence of perineural invasion, extra prostatic extension that you can identify on needle core biopsy, although not very commonly, and seminal vesicle invasion.